I thought it would be a good idea today to take some time to work on a skill that we all need and can always be improved, and that's sight reading. So before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk about, let's just do something a little different and take a second and do a sight reading warm-up exercise together. So I would recommend that you grab the PDF that's attached to this video and grab your base. We're going to look at um, several exercises, one right after the next. They're not really musical at all. They're just meant to sort of connect your head and your ears with your hands and so on. And just kind of give, a, give us a chance to get in the frame of mind of sight reading. But also, and we'll talk about this in detail in a minute, I want you to not stop. No matter what, do not stop and just keep reading. Keep looking ahead and keep reading. All right, let's check it out. One, two, three.
Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Matt Rabicki. If you want to learn more about playing jazz bass, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and below is a free PDF that goes along with today's discussion and video. So we are talking about sight reading, and when I was thinking about discussing it and practicing it, I was thinking about dividing it into three sections. Sort of the overall idea can be divided into three things. And the first is sort of conceptual or data. Do you understand what the notes are? Do you understand what the chords mean? Do you understand how to read um, a written out chord chart, for example? Then the next thing is practicing the actual skills. So taking time by yourself to try to develop your ability to sight read more effectively. And then third is the application of that skill. So you wanna be able to take what you are working on and actually put it in real musical situations. And we'll talk about each of these uh, in time in little separate sections of this video. So as I mentioned, the first thing we wanna do is talk about concepts and information. So let's deal first with the data that is on a page of music that we need to read. If you feel confident about reading the symbols and information and so on, you can just skip ahead to the next section. As always, I won't be offended. But if you're not quite sure or need maybe a little bit of a refresher, let's take some time and talk about the kinds of things that we see on a page. The first thing I wanna look at, and that is in the PDF, is chord nomenclature. And this is just basically how chords are written. The reason I sort of make a point of this is there are several ways to write chords. The same chord can have a variety of different ways of actually being written out. And that's a little bit unfortunate, but it's just kind of the reality of the world. A very simple thing would be if you have a C minor seven chord, it could say C M I N seven, or it could say C and a lowercase M and then a seven, or it could have C and then a, a little sort of minus sign and then a seven and so on. There's a variety of those. So I've listed out all the ones that I think are appropriate on one of the pages in the PDF. And then next we wanna look at the kinds of things that we'll see on a chart, not just the notes on the page or the rhythms, but what is the sort of roadmap of the music? And what can we expect to look at when we see new kinds of music? What should we look for? We're gonna take one of the songs that we'll play a little later, and I've sort of highlighted important things on this sample chart. So for example, we're talking about where the senyo is, or what we call the sign, um, where the performance notes are, and that each of these things is important, and we wanna know what they are and what they do. So if you're not familiar with them, there's certainly a lot of information on the internet. You could certainly write to me if there's stuff you don't understand, but this page covers several things that you'll see like repeats and signs and coda signs and so on. Now I wanna make a note that everything that's on a page, if the person is even mildly professional when they write it, means something. And I say this because when I was coming up and learned to read and so on, oftentimes I would just dismiss extensions on a chord or dismiss dynamic markings or articulations. And I found out later that those are actually important. And sometimes, oftentimes, people actually expect you to play them. So everything that is on the page, every little bit of ink that is on there is important in some way. It will come to you as you have more experience as to what is the most important. And I'll try to point out some of those things uh, as we talk about looking at a chart for the first time. But familiarize yourself with what's gonna be on a chart, that's important. Next in the PDF, I just have a refresher of what the key signatures are. And that's of course gonna be helpful as we figure out what notes are which. And you'll notice this is in the circle of fourths or fifths, depending on how you look at it. And it also says how many sharps or flats are in each given key. And of course, you wanna be familiar with time signatures, meter. I didn't put anything in the PDF of this. Hopefully you understand that in four, four, that means there are four quarter notes. The bottom one of those numbers indicate what is the rhythmic division that is used. So six eight means that there are six eighth notes in one measure. Five four, there are five quarter notes. The four stands for the quarter note. And lastly, I have some articulation reference for you in case you need a refresher on that as well. And there's a helpful page that um, I got from the great educator and saxophonist Ron Carter, who has really been developing a sense of how to verbally communicate articulations in the jazz language. So check that out. Next, let's look at how we can actually develop the skill. We've got the information now, and now we wanna develop the ability to actually read. On the PDF, I've got a list of practice strategies for you to actually practice sight reading. And I want to stress that if you wanna make this an important ability of yours, you need to give it priority. So you need to practice it 
just like you practice everything else, it needs to be part of your daily routine. It's very important that you consistently do some amount of it that will really reap benefits. You can't sort of fit it all into one two hour practice session and get all your sight reading in. You really have to do it every day or consistently to really make a difference. I also want to point out that I found it very, very helpful when I am really just pulling out something to sight read first time without having seen it before, that if there is a way to get a recording of what I am playing with, that will really, really help to solidify and cement what you are seeing on the page with what you're hearing and playing. So a tricky rhythm might be very, very obvious when you hear somebody else play it. And one thing I make a note of here on the PDF and that I mentioned at the beginning is do not stop. Practice not stopping. You wanna keep proper rhythmic feel, you wanna keep your place in the music, in the form and in what the written music, but you really, really, really have to teach yourself to not stop. It's okay to make mistakes. It is a normal part of life. This is not brain surgery, no one's gonna die if you make a mistake. The more important thing is that you keep going. So teach yourself to just keep reading. And we'll think about that in a little more detail in just a moment. Another thing I wanna mention is to familiarize yourself with common problems and what is sort of good notation and not so good notation. When I say common problems, I'm talking about like some of the samples that I'm gonna show you on the screen here. Uh, next to me, we see uh, an example of a, an original composition that, you know, sometimes somebody's gonna, this was probably literally faxed to me <laughs> um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you can see like, I can, you can barely even read the note that is there. That's a common problem, sort of actually being able to read somebody's handwritten notes. Another thing would be just sort of a general sense of being a little sloppy. As you can tell, when you first look at this arrangement of Tin Angel, it's really hard to tell what is important here, what's going on, what am I sort of being told, right? Because it's just not clear, there's things sort of crossed out, There's it's, it's not really written, written clearly so that you can actually see what the words or the numbers are. So that's a common problem as well. And then lastly, you'll see another sort of um, transcription of an arrangement of Satin Dahl where we've got all the problems there. It is not clear what's going on. There are bars crossed out, there's whole staves crossed out. Um, the spacing is weird. Sometimes you've got four measures on the line, sometimes more. You've got things typed in. There are written notes that are in bass clef and treble clef. It's just like, it's very, very hard to quickly get a sense of what this is. And so it's important for you to sort of not be thrown off by that because it is very, very common for people to not sort of adhere to proper notation rules, so to speak. And to sort of demonstrate that, I wanna talk about um, a version of the famous Frank Sinatra performance of All the Way. First here, you'll see the original piece of music that I got. And while it's printed out and done in Finale or some program like that, which is good, there are a lot of internal problems that really frustrate me. In fact, this is a really big pet peeve of mine across the board because it doesn't take that much time to do things in a way that are much easier to understand for the player. So on this original chart, you can see that there are instructions and chords clashing over there, literally printed out on top of each other. You don't know what it says. There are strange numbers of bars. Sometimes there's like not, uh, six, sometimes there's more. And on top of that all, like there's only one staff on the second page, which why would you cram everything in there if you're gonna have two pages? That makes no sense whatsoever. Additionally, like, the phrases are not really in natural spots. Normally we wanna lay out a staff that is gonna have a natural amount of bars per staff. So either four or eight, sometimes you have to do three, sometimes two, like you'll see in a minute, but you wanna have some logical sort of layout of the bars per staff. And that's gonna make a big difference when you are playing it like, okay, here comes another, I see another section coming. This is the end of a four bar phrase. It just makes you feel more at ease when you're looking at something that is not crowded. All the directions are clear. You can see what's important, which is not the case here. There's a direction for playing Arco right at the beginning that's like you, so easy to miss. Um, and where it goes to pits is really easy. So let's take a look at one improvement on that. And what I've done is take this exact layout, this exact number of bars, but I've written it all out again and just changed it so that we can see the directions more clearly, we can see the chords more clearly, and it's just easier to actually look at. It's more legible, basically. But you notice it's still kind of crowded, right? It still feels like, why is this all smushed together when it doesn't need to be? 
So take a look at this third example where I've taken the first good things I did and then now I've given more breathing room. Generally, I've gone to four measures per system. Uh, at the beginning is two measures long, so I left it as two at the beginning. But you'll notice now that the section numbers, which are measure numbers like three and 11 and 19 and so on, are just on the left side of the page, your left, <laughs> left side of the page, and properly sort of help you understand what the form of the song is. Also, instructions like Arco and Pitts are clearer. They're in a box um, and they are well spaced so that you understand what's supposed to go on. So why don't you keep your bass with you and let's take an attempt to sight read this. And again, do not stop and think about the fact that I have set it up in a way that will hopefully make the whole thing easier. You can relax a little bit about where sections come and so on. So let's check that out. When somebody loves you, it's no good unless he loves you. All the way, happy to be near you when you need someone to cheer you. All the way, taller. That's how it's got to feel Deeper than the deep blue sea is That's how deep it goes If it's real When somebody needs you It's no good unless he needs you Oh One thing I wanted to mention is that when I made this final version, I also took the time to listen more carefully to the actual recording to not only familiarize myself with it, but see if there were any mistakes in the transcription. And in fact, there were. I didn't get one of them quite yet. I was rushing a little bit, but I got several things that were really important, like the very first two measures are actually an octave down. I suppose that's not terribly important, but those are the kinds of things that will make a difference in between sounding authentic or not. So next, in developing our skill at reading, as I have mentioned already, teach yourself not to stop. And let's practice that together for a moment. What I want to do is take Arvel Shaw playing bass on Hello Dolly, which is admittedly a bit corny, but it was a very popular recording and Arvel sounds great as always. You may remember me mentioning him from Two Perfect Two Feels, uh, that I did in a video several months ago. So we're talking about Arvel playing a two feel and one of the reasons that I chose it as well is that it is not that hard to read. We're really just working on the skill of reading ahead. So let's read it together first and then I wanna show you something after we do that.
So how did you do trying to read that first time without getting a chance to look at it? Well, let's take another pass at it. Keep your base with you. And now I'm going to um, sort of animate on the screen where I think you should be looking ahead. And basically, as I broke it down, it's sort of like when you get to beat four, you should have already processed what that bar was and you should be looking ahead. So every time you're sort of one beat ahead, which looks weird when you try to play along with it and so on, but I hope that it would demonstrate a sense of what it takes to be looking ahead. If you can look ahead further, that's fantastic. When I was trying to sort of time out how far I look ahead, it's very difficult to really figure out what I'm doing and explain it in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, how I'm looking ahead because some of it is really just you're sort of grabbing a bunch of information at once. The more experience you have, the more you can sort of um, really quickly not only process what's happening, but do away with what's not important and so on. So if I see a measure, you know, in a split second, I know that's all quarter notes, like the rhythm's taken care of, right? I mean, it's a very simple example, but um, the more you familiar you are with what rhythms look like uh, printed out and so on, the faster you can process what is going on. So be looking ahead all the time. And as I say, practice doing it. Hello, Dollar. This is Louis Dollar. It's so nice to have you back where you belong. You look and swell, Dollar. I can't tell, darling. You still growing, you still growing, you still going strong. I feel the room sway, but the band's playing one of our old favorite songs from way back when. So take a rap, fellas, find her an empty lap, fellas, darling. Lastly, in the PDF of developing our skill, I just wanted to mention to not forget to familiarize yourself with other clefs, specifically the treble and the tenor clef. Tenor clef is usually more in classical music. In fact, I've never seen it in a jazz piece that I can think of, um, but it's basically like to reduce ledger lines, but you're sort of learning a whole new clef that isn't used very often. So it's a little bit frustrating to me that that's still a, a process. I'd rather see like eight VA or I'd rather see treble clef. But um, it is very common that you will see treble. And also one thing I didn't write out that I wanna mention is that it's very common for us as bass players to receive somebody else's part. Um, the pianist or guitar player. And if it's a piano part, very often it will have what looks like a bass part, but it's a piano left hand part. So there are ledger line notes that we can't play. We're actually playing um, that octave, but we read it an octave higher. So you'll see like low C's and stuff, which you can't get unless you have an extension on your bass. So it's very, very common that we have to transpose things up an octave. And so getting familiar with that is very, very helpful. So when you're practicing, get the materials together that you wanna just pull out and be able to read, as well as things to play along with, to just pull out and read. 
but be reading lots of different kinds of things, handwritten things, classical pieces, uh, piano parts and all that kind of stuff is going to help you to feel more comfortable when you go into a situation where you have to do it for real. So now let's talk about applying this skill in the real world. As I mentioned, now you may not have the opportunity to read th things on a gig or in a rehearsal as often as you would like. If you can, try to get together with a group of folks, even one other person, and do sight read things together. The reason for that is not only will you sort of be able to lean on each other if one of you sort of doesn't know what something's supposed to sound like or one of you is a stronger reader, the other person can lean on them and vice versa, but also that sort of pressure really helps us to sort of focus and narrow our mind. So doing it together really, really helps. Doing it on a gig is terrifying, <laughs> but you will get to a place, if it's important to you, where you will be able to do that. I just want to tell a very quick story about sight reading. Uh, for several years, I was subbing uh, in Broadway pits in New York. Many, many shows I subbed, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 shows over my time there. And um, there was a new show that opened just a few years ago called The Prom, and I was one of the primary subs on that show. The process is that the, the subs get are chosen before the show starts, usually, and you get the material ahead of time to practice so you're ready to go in and do a show. You, there's no rehearsal, you just go in and do a show. We had just gotten the material like a week ahead of time, opening night was happening, and it was a huge snowstorm. And the main bass player, who had been rehearsing for months and knew the music down cold, could not make it into New York City from New Jersey. It was, it was just snowed out. So he called all of us, who wants to play this first show? None of us had time to have read this music and gotten ready for it. And so one of us, one of my colleagues, actually said yes and went in and sight read the opening night to a Broadway show. Wow, that takes so much bravery, right? Like to not feel like you're just going to completely collapse in the moment. He's a very, very talented musician and I'm sure he did great, but there's no way he got everything that was on the page. But his ability to sort of be ready was very, very helpful in the moment. And so that pressure of doing something live like that can really sort of, you know, turn coal into diamonds, so to speak, right? So we want to put ourselves in scenarios that are as real as possible. So what that means is to separate sort of etudes of sight reading, like where you have one page or like the warm up we did today, separate that from real music that you might see in the real world. And also, as I say, try to get into a situation where you are sight writing things in a rehearsal, not in the highest pressure situation of a Broadway show or a big gig on stage. When we are playing things in the real world, we've got real world instructions to contend with, not just the notes on the page and the rhythms. We have to have worked that out ahead of time as far as having some strength in that skill of ourselves. But very often we will see lots of different things based on what the composer or the arranger did. For example, take a look at this um, one page from an arrangement of Darn That Dream. We've got rhythmic hits there. We've got endings that we've you know certainly looked at before. We've got instructions on that the bass and the piano play things together. There are actual drum parts on this page as well. There are specific uh, rhythms written out, specific notes written for us as opposed to just the rhythms. And there are chord changes with slashes, meaning we have to improvise. There are instructions for when there's a fill and, and we have to stop and so on. So there's a lot of information on this one page. The reason is that the composer arranger wants to give us as the players as much information as we can use to help us successfully read it in as short a time as possible. But at the same time, you can see there's a lot of information there. We've got the main melody and so on and so forth. And you see there's a measure of two, four in there. It's in four, 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 and then suddenly two, right? So these are the kinds of things that we need to quickly assess as we uh, encounter new music that's arranged by somebody else. So as I talk about in the PDF, as far as applying this, your very best tool as far as actually doing this in the real world, in a rehearsal, or on a gig is the ability to investigate a lot of things very, very quickly before you even start playing. And I've got a list here of, I think, the most important things to look at, and I think everybody generally agrees on that. I'll read straight off. We want to look at what are the tempo and genre notes. We want to think about the main key signature, make sure we notice that. Any basic obvious harmonic progressions, like can you quickly see this is a 2-5 going to a 1? Do you see this is like a blues form, for example? 
And speaking of that, we also want to look at the form itself, right? We want to try to figure out what the roadmap is. What is the form of the song? Is it AABA? Is it something else? Is it through composed? We want to be able to try to assess that quickly. Um, we also want to look at any articulations and um, we want to look at any articulations, including dynamics, of course. Now, these can kind of be forgiven as the first time you read it, but understand they are important and try to apply them very quickly as soon as you read it again. As I mentioned, the roadmaps, so we want to look where repeats are, where directions are for codas and, and, and um, going back to the sign and where do solos happen and so on and so forth. We can assess that very, very quickly. And importantly, we want to look for unusual or really conspicuous elements. So things that are solo for us, um, very extreme registers, something that's outside what we can play, like the low C on a ledger line, for example, if it's a piano part, or something that's very, very high on the bass. We want to be able to notice ahead of time, hey, I need to work on that. We also want to look at density, how many notes are to get, you know, is there a lot of 16th notes? Um, is this at a very fast tempo in itself? Is this going to be difficult to play? And also like peculiar rhythms that might be difficult to play or something that's maybe written in a way that's confusing. Sometimes people don't really respect the sort of rules, as I mentioned, about notation. And so something that is a simple rhythm is going to look a little funny. Also, as I talked about with All The Way, we want to look at phrase lengths that are laid out on the paper. But not just how many bars per staff, but also are there weird length phrases themselves, musical phrases like is the A section nine bars long as opposed to eight, for example. And of course, we want to look for any changes to time signature or key signature. We noticed those at the beginning, but do they change? These are the kinds of things that you can very, very quickly assess and see what the most important things that you need to address will be as you either read it for the first time or have maybe 30 seconds or maybe 10 minutes to go over it before you actually play it. So if you've got those 10 minutes or 30 seconds to go over it, pick the thing that looks sort of the scariest to you and just isolate it and work on it slowly, really, really slowly, as much time as you have for it, work on that part by itself. Then fit it into the whole piece and try to read it without stopping. Again, the entire piece if you can. R rinse and repeat, right? If there's other problem spots, try to work them out. Either visually just look at them and say, okay, now I understand what this is, or actually work it out on the instrument. And again, you might not have a lot of time to do this, so pick the thing that's going to be the most challenging or you know is going to give you some trouble. But at the same time, all the things that we mentioned before apply. Do not stop when you're reading them and always keep the proper feel and keep your place in the music. Mistakes are okay. So using all the techniques that we've talked about, let's take a look at some pieces that we can sort of assess very, very quickly and hopefully be able to play very quickly. First is an exercise piece that John Goldsby wrote called Read This. And if we take a quick look at it, let's find the important things together, right? So first we're looking at right in the upper left, we've got tempo and the feeling. We're seeing repeat signs. I see that repeats four times and to only play the written uh, notes on the fourth time. As it goes on, after we repeat that four times, we're in a two field, but it starts with some written notes. And then there are some written notes at the end before, um, at the end of the first uh, ending. And I'm looking and I see that there are eight measures in this phrase. Now that's not really laid out very, very clearly on the staff system. We've got five measures per staff, but everything else being clear and clean and this all being on one page, it makes sense. We'll see there's a second ending with some more written notes and that second repeat is also eight measures long. And then I see um, the senior or the sign there right after at the double bar line, you see we're going into a new section there. We've got some written notes that go into walking and that is the walking part is five, six, seven, eight parts long and then some more written notes. Then it goes to three, four, which is uh, something that we definitely want to be able to pay attention and back to four and a written line with the baritone saxophone. We see the coda sign there and we see after the coda sign, we've got four measures of a solo. It says DS al coda, which we want to go back to the sign and play up until the coda sign uh, right before it, the A flat seven, and then jump to the final five bars where there are some fermatas that would be cued and then a bass cadenza. So we're going to play a little solo as the time is held out. So why don't we try to read this together and see how we do two, three, four.
Okay, so how'd you do? If it's helpful, at the end of this video, I'm gonna put that play along track just right at the end if you wanna play along with that tune by yourself. Um, it's just an iReal Pro thing that I set up, like there's not an actual recording of that exercise that Mr. Goldby did. But that said, finally, let's check out a tune of mine, if you don't mind, if you will indulge me. It's called Big Money and the Left Side. It's on my CD called Driven. And this is sort of a tribute to the 90s Young Lions. Big Money is the nickname for the bassist Rodney Whitaker. The Left Side is a tune that he played very often uh, with Roy Hargrove. And I just love that period of the history of the music. So this is sort of a tribute to them. And so let's take a look at this chart. Um, and this one is more an actual tune as opposed to an exercise. So there's not quite as much in there, but there are some important things to note. First of all, like you would have in a real rehearsal or in a recording, there is a four bar drum intro that isn't written on the chart. So that's something that you would want to pencil in. Always bring a pencil to rehearsals, right? And to the gig. So you want to pencil in, there's a four bar drum intro, and then we start off. It is a swing feel. It's again, medium tempo, and um, it starts with a walking line, but we have some very definitive hits in the bass part, the bottom line of that staff. Additionally, if you'll notice, like I said, we should check out ahead of time the length of phrases. My A sections are in fact nine measures long and each A section uh, at the beginning ends with a little bass fill for a couple measures. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, you'll notice at the end of the B section, there is a triplet hit and when you hear it, it in performance, it sounds a little odd. It's the way I intended it. It's a little off kilter. So this is something that you'll need to pay attention to. And at this medium tempo, that triplet happens kind of fast. Da da da, da da da, da da da. So um, that's something to note. And so where there are these rhythmic slashes, I'm not telling you as the bass player what note to play, nor am I telling myself, but that we make these hits with the rest of the band. So would you read this for me as well to do a little bit more of an exercise? This is Big Money and the Left Side. Two, three, one, two, three. Hopefully that was all helpful to you. I think that practicing your sight reading skill will pay dividends that you don't expect. And so I suggest that you really spend some time making it a part of your daily practice. As always, please remember to like, subscribe, look for the PDF, and remember, straight ahead and strive for tone.